You know, so much of, uh, of our nervous system challenge is sort of due to residue, as we know, of fight, flight, and freeze responses. And, you know, for different reasons, those responses don't chill out. They're meant to just sort of come up, hit their threshold, and come out. They, they come up, do the job, save your life, and then they go back in the firehouse and, and wait until, you know, the next fire. Uh, but for uh, various reasons, some of them stay out and about in these responses. And one of the, the you know, this, this area in particular is so vulnerable uh, because of all of the neural architecture that's coming out of the brainstem and then into the body and into, you know, innervating the entire system. And so uh, for that reason, things like, like whiplash, for instance, are hugely disorganizing for people because it really sends so many signals into, say, the vestibular system around disorganization. It just doesn't take much intensity to remind the system of, oh, I, you know, that system is already sort of um, sounding a fire alarm all the time. Uh, and so people are really surprised that, you know, like a really small little tiny uh, fender bender, you know, can have this massive disorganizing effect. And some people's systems really just disintegrate. They really fall apart and can't function even after a small uh, event like that. And that's because the system uh, of orientation includes certainly the movement, you know, of the neck and the head and the eyes, but also the vestibular system. You know, the vestibular system is just so sensitive. You know, you can tell, you can tell like, oh, I just move my head like this much and you feel that, and it's really quite fine. So uh, if that system gets dinged and it becomes sensitized, it just doesn't take much movement for the whole system to uh, really uh, be perturbed. So uh, it's, it's really challenging then, and, and that, that, um, that sense of inability to orient and the inability to use one's vestibular system to orient in, in relationship to gravity, uh, and then use the eyes and neck and the head to orient and map the environment is going to make a person feel unsafe. Because if I can't map myself in the current moment, my system of fight or flight or freeze can't develop a plan that I can, that I can use to, you know, like get out of here because I don't have a map. It's like, you know, if, if the alarm system comes up and it says, now run, and, and then, but it's like, uh, run where? Run what door? You know, which direction do I run? And, and so the system has real challenges in feeling safe because it can't create a, a motor plan to run, say, run out the door. You know, when, when the fight or flight system uh, jumps up, then it sends a signal of a plan of action. And that plan of action is like run out the door, jump over the snake, you know, uh, you know, fight, bite, kick, you know, scream, whatever. And, and those are specific plans based in the mapping of the present moment and, and all of the information coming about the nature of the threat. And if I can't get mapped in the present moment, then the, the emergency systems can't devise a plan. It's like, you know, the, the alarm is happening, but we don't have a map to tell you, your system, your body, where to go and what to do. So mm -hmm. as a consequence, people feel unsafe. So, mm -hmm. And I was thinking as you were talking too, in terms of this idea of the map and mapping the environment, also when neck and shoulders start freeing, that different maps or different plans can happen. Like somebody today in this intro lesson said that at the end of the lesson, she felt this impulse to bring her knees to her chest and give herself a big hug. And like that, that was available because there was this different freedom or reorganization that this impulse for this other kind of mapping <laughs> was right there. It was really cool. Yeah, that's right. If, if we say, oh, you know, we, the system needs to map and it needs to orient to, you know, connect to the environment through the senses and map the environment. If I have structures that are unable to move or giving me all the negative feedback, either from tension or pain or, you know, or, you know actual scar tissue, you know, then there are, there are all kinds of reasons that I'll have difficulty orienting because I don't have that fluidity. 
I don't have, just like you're saying, I don't have the available ease of, of, of orienting and then mapping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and those are really common in the, in the shoulders, neck and head, and, uh, occipital area, all of that, uh, in part because of our startle response. You know, the, the startle response is the, this turtling response, you know, of, of like this. So there is, there is the tension along the trapezius, the withdrawal and the constriction of the neck, and this response in particular, you know, then, you know, is a constriction of this, this area and very hard to, you know, really orient when you got that going on. Um, and people all the time, and, I, uh, you know, and we talk about this a lot, Tiffany, but um, uh, in organic intelligence, but, you know, people a lot of times will then go to body workers and go, oh, my shoulders are so tense, you know, and here, stretch them out and, you know, like relieve the tension and not realizing that really, and this is, this is again, what we talk about in organic intelligence, what we'll talk about in our, our sharing on the course as well, which is that, that the main thing to think about is that um, tension patterns hold uh, because they are waiting for, you know, uh, enough um, intensity to reach the threshold. So, you know, you think, oh, this, this, and this, you know, muscle position or this, this position of the shoulders, you would think that it would want to go ahead and relax. But in fact, oftentimes it has to be just a little bit more intense to reach that threshold for relaxation. In other words, the movement, if, if the entirety of the movement is like, like this, but my shoulders are just tense like this, they are in effect stuck halfway where they wanna go. That is, they're, they're like right in here. So often what we'll do is allow people to let that tension guide the movement up to its threshold uh, and then it will release. And mm -hmm. I know these traditions do that. And it, does, does Feldenkrais think about that direction, going with the direction rather than fighting it? Yeah, totally. That, that's um, in the co first couple of intro classes I taught this, they were, I called them unwinding the body, body pattern of anxiety. And what we did was just basically like go with this folding flexion pattern. We did one on the side and one on the back. And so it is like exaggerating and finding our particular, you know, it's not like symmetrical. It's like for some person, it's more like this or like this or like that or whatever. And that by going with the pattern, but in this framework of pleasure and ease, so not like adding more discomfort, but just in the actual pattern of the movement, including the shoulder and the pelvis and what you do with your jaw and your eyes and exploring the different options and going, getting more clear about the pattern your own pattern that you do. And then when you come out of it, you're unfolding and unwinding out of the pattern naturally, not like correcting yourself out of it, but that it just unwinds on its own. Uh, that, that difference between going with the pattern and letting it sort of complete its work, complete its intensity threshold is so key. And you know, one of the things that we don't talk about quite as much in, uh, in the heart training, um, is how each of those segments, all of those segments that you mentioned, the eyes, the jaw, the neck, the shoulders, the spine, the pelvis, each of those adds intensity. And so, you know, as, as we're working, we're watching really carefully that we don't, that we stay right within the range you're talking about, ease, pleasure, you know, comfort, uh, ability, sense of agency, and and we stay in those, especially if one is really like oriented, you can stay in those and then you can experience the intensity that is actually pleasurable. So it's, it's pleasurable like expansion and then relaxation. And you really get the sense of that flow and pulsation of expansion and, and then letting go. Um, and each of those segments can add extra intensity. So for some people, the eye segment, if the eyes move just that much, that'll flare the intensity because it may be associated with high intensity event. Like there may be a high intensity event that happened where the eyes did this, which then links this movement to that, that high intensity. And that's just state specific 
learning sp state specificity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, you're being able to like see like which of these segments adds too much intensity, then might allow you to really um, coach uh, our clients to just the right amount of intensity. So instead of using the eyes, okay, now let's just do the, the pelvis, the shoulders, and the head and not include the eyes. And that might bring up enough intensity to then uh, sort of catalyze that deactivation and settling um, response. Yeah, and in the context of a group situation where there's not that individual attunement around these different pieces, I think the really creating an environment where you're in, where we're playing with even the thought of bringing in this other piece, does that feel good or does that feel like too much? And if it feels like too much, then you don't bring that in or you imagine it, you sort of by learning, it's like this intensity threshold of learning also that you're by reducing the effort and the, by reducing the intensity of the stimulus of the whole each piece that you're adding, you can start to feel like, oh, that's a little too much, so I'm not going to do that. Or that's a little bit, that direction, uh, I'm not feeling that. Today we were doing this thing of bringing the hand to the face and we were doing these different movements. And I started with just the thought of bringing your hand to your face. That already has, like, do I feel that impulse? What is there? Maybe that's even enough without actually doing the thing. Yeah, uh, I think that's so good. You know, people think that, oh, it's just mind or something, but there's a real connection between what I imagine in my mind and what my physiology is doing. That's, that's state specific understandings. And, uh, and there are the, you know, the mirror neurons. So that as soon as I think about or imagine a goal directed movement, those motor neurons are firing, those patterns are firing and the intensity is going to be coming up. And so it'll be coming up less probably than if I'm doing the movement, but it's still coming up. And we just don't know if, if those patterns, if those pathways are, you know, uh, have already been sort of overworn to be too much too fast, you know, and over threshold. So uh, it's, I, I love how you're offering these various layers of, of experience engaging around this really key idea, which is intensity. And really that there is a, this organic intensity level that is, uh, that is you know, catalyzing the, the system's self-organization. You know, we used to think in terms of psychology, and as you know, in OI, we say, we'd like you to resync your psychology. Um, because it was like, oh, let's rethink those events. So let's rethink the trauma or, or, you know, really go through it or recall what happened or what it was. But all of that uh, is less relevant to the physiology, to what really is regulating my whole anxiety system, which is the level of intensity that's going on. So really bring the focus like you are back onto intensity and really gauging the appropriate intensity is really key. And it takes a long time to do. And, and it's so amazing to people that, you know, like, like we'll be working and, and the movement, a movement will show up and you're like, oh, I wonder if you would feel that movement, you know, just really just feeling this little movement like this. And the person says, wow, you know, uh, I, I feel like my heart rate is increasing, my breath is, my heart, my respiration is increasing. What is that? And when they say, what is that? They're like, oh, what event was that? What trauma was that or something? But, but really what it is, is acceleration by body position of intensity. So for us to refocus our, our work uh, around the assessment and the ongoing evaluation of the intensity level, is absolutely the right direction and, and mm -hmm. your skill and modulating that is is really cool like like you say in a group setting you have to do that you know quite carefully mm -hmm. and teaching people the skills to like really track that i mean i know there's like a level of one-on-one -on -one that get, it gets more and more refined when we can do that one-on-one -on -one. and then there are these kind of toolbox of of man of of uh, sensing our own levels of intensity that, that we can bring. Right. And sometimes when we can't sense, when clients can't 
sense the intensity level, you know, it's like covered over in like states of freeze or dissociation or, or numbness or any number of things. Then the other way to assess that is like, how much orientation do I have online? Like how much background awareness of the environment in this moment do I have? And that's, that's another way to, to gauge it. If I lose contact with the environment, then that says, that says the intensity is probably coming up. And mm -hmm. so it might be time to, to just get a little bit more background awareness of the environment, just to keep things extra safe, extra comfortable. And this idea of the orienting architecture or that even that languaging of the orienting architecture, where does that come from? That languaging, do you know? Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I talk about, you know, this platform. Mm -hmm. this platform that is all about mapping us in the here and now. And, and, and all of this, I mean, it's, it's the entirety, you know, when, when you, know, you described it really well, it's, it's the eyes, the neck, the head, the shoulders, and the spine and the pelvis. You know, it's a whole body process. And for most of us, and especially I think in the West, so much of, uh, of our uh, sense of orientation is sort of shoulders up. And, and I think that's because, you know, you, you hear, you know, in the, in the military, people are told to, you know, put the head on the, sw on the swivel, you know, to keep that, that, uh, that going. But that's, that's a little bit more in the direction of hypervigilance. And, and I think part of the reason for that, and obviously training in that is a good idea if you're, you know, needing to keep your attention into the environment for threat. Um, but, you know, for us, I think there is so much... Uh, dorsal vagal influence there's so much freeze so much dissociation and when you get dissociation what you get often is this upward displacement that right like dissociation is is often this sense of like like getting away from something down there and then people will describe like you know being up above and seeing things from below and it's part of the reason why i think uh, in the west we're we are thought to be more, more um, brainy or, you know, uh, headbound or something. And I think that's because there's, there's this level of dissociation of moving away from the body and then escaping into the head. Uh, and, and so there is this upward displacement, which puts so much more um, emphasis than on all of this. Instead of like a whole body orientation, there is this there is, you know, more of this emphasis and, and uh, really important to free that up and begin to get a whole body sense of orientation. So then in your definition is the orienting architecture then is the whole architecture of the whole person or is it? No, I'm, I'm really emphasizing sort of shoulders on up uh -huh. uh, because that's, that's what people have awareness of mostly. You know, real orientation, in a way, is my system fully in touch with, without separation, the environment, internal and external environment. That's, that's really full orientation. We just don't have it that much. You know, that, kind of, that level of embodiment and that level of, um, of integration and seamless encounter with this moment is so rare these days. And, you know, I call it the age of dis disintegration because there's just so much freeze, there's so much fight and flight and freeze for all the reasons, you know, we talk about in NOI. And so we really talk about this orienting architecture in part also because that's where you get so much of the vestibular stimulation and you get the vestibular feedback. And also because the eyes and the neck and the head really are also primary. And that's, that's in terms of like fight and flight, uh, you know, being able to assess the environment through those mechanisms uh, is, uh, is facilitated by turning the head, including the auditory channel. Like if I, I, you know, I can tell where things are by basically, you know, kind of uh, we, we locate sounds because, you know, something, a sound coming from the right uh, reaches our ears faster slightly than it reaches the, it reaches the right ear faster than it reaches the left. It's like, oh, I can do this echolocation. And so when I, when I turn, it's like, you know, you know, when you, when you say a dog's name, it goes, and it kind of turns its head. It's like, 
it's trying to really locate things. And part of that is listening and sending the ears, you know, in these different locations to get different feedback so we can really locate where things are. So all of that says eyes, neck, head, and shoulder, uh, the shoulders in particular because of that startle response. If we can relieve that startle response, that leaves the neck and head more free to be able to be in uh, full rotation and, and, uh, and yeah, be able to map us into the environment. Mm, I think I've liked that phrase, the orienting architecture, maybe also because of my like art background and just like that, the, the art of architecture, you know, that it's, there's such an art to architecture. So that I've just loved that layer, adding that layer onto this whole thing. Yeah. It's cool. It's so important because you know, again, and just this is, again, the uh, reflection of the age of disintegration, but, um, you know, we think, oh, I'm going to orient now. So that means I am going to look around the room. But if, uh, if the physiology, if the architecture is saying, oh, I, I actually, the system wants to do this, but I am thinking, oh, I should, I should, ugh, I should look over this way, you know, because Oh, I can do this, but I want to be able to do this. Uh, and, you know, this separation between the organic impulse and whatever other cognitive frameworks go on. And so the orienting architecture it says something about the, the primary structures that are involved. If I can be sort of in tune with the architecture, just like you're describing, then this quality of ease opens up. And when I get that ease, and the system achieves what it's looking for, it reaches a level of intensity through pleasure, and then it can settle. And once it is settled and has received that support, then more behavioral uh, flexibility is available. So, you know, for the person who has the impulse of the head going in this direction, but they're thinking, oh, you know, what I need to do is balance it out by going, oh yeah, I did that. You know, if instead they could get the satisfaction and pleasure of this, that pleasure creates an affective like nest that allows us then to do further exploration, right? From the point of safety, from the point of support, then we grow our capacity for exploration. Mm, I love that nest, the affective nest. That's so, so beautiful. Yep. So yep. good. Yeah. So good. And you have, and you, you're having uh, other members come into this that are talking about some of the physiology and some of the ways that, you know, the nerves are uh, coming through the thoracic outlet and other places. And that's really key here. Yeah. Freedom and the orienting architecture. It's a, it's a loop, right? A feedback loop between the feeling of safety and then the experience of being able to move and see and orient and gives you the feedback about, say, you know, the whole like when I started the lesson today, I was like this challenging situation today, right before I was going to teach. And I was like, completely, when I stood up and I felt what my body wanted to do, I, I could only look down. It was like this, but it was like this respecting, like, this is exactly where I'm at right now. Completely like lit up with my feelings, completely like this. And then doing the lesson, only doing, only listening to it. At the end, I was like completely, oh, yeah. this range up here was so much more available. I was so much more upright and it happened naturally through respecting every moment of like the movements, but my experience of like following the path of ease and having my eyes open, like spacing out sometimes and like just really listening to the the invitation and my own curiosity and play within that and then this natural unfolding of this freedom that's fantastic exciting yeah totally, totally. <laughs>